chapter 22 
And then when you're there, we'll just open up in a word of prayer and ask for the Lord's help as we look at this portion of Scripture, all right? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have to gather together in fellowship and worship you for who you are and for what you've done, providing for all of our needs according to your glorious riches, but most importantly, the need of a Savior through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask now as we look into your word, Father God, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well, applying it to our lives. And we ask now, Father God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll be able to communicate through me, Father God, and I'll be able to effectively communicate what it has been laid on my heart by you to share. And in your Son, Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You know, King Josiah serves as a great example for us to see how to live according to God's Word and apply it to our lives. As Christians, our aim or our goal in life should be to be found well-pleasing by God, as the Apostle Paul states in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. We make it our aim in life, whether absent or present, to be found well-pleasing by Him. The problem that we face is that there are many who profess Christ, yet they are self-willed, looking to please themselves and to please others, rather than trying to please God by keeping His commandments. Scripture lets us know that during the time of kings in the nation of Israel, prior to the Babylonian captivity, there were many evil kings who abandoned God and walked in idolatry, serving the creature rather than the Creator. Josiah was one of the few good kings who walk in the way of the Lord, not turning to the right or to the left, but staying on the straight and narrow pathway. We all can learn from his example that was set by Josiah, especially young people. Josiah is proof that you're not too young to do the Lord's work. Josiah was only eight years old when he became kin of Judah, and he served as kin for 31 years until his death at the age of 39 years old. And throughout his short life of 39 years, we see and learn a lot about how we too can successfully live our lives according to God's will. During the time of Judges, prior to a kin being chosen, we see in the book of Judges, certain cycles that happened. We see the cycles of sin. That's the first thing that happened. Then we see the consequences of the people's sin, which was them being caught and captive and oppressed by the foreign nations around them. Then we see Israelites cry for God's deliverance. And we see that God would send or appoint a judge to deliver his people from the oppression they were facing from the four nations. And then once the people were delivered and back to comfort, they would fall back into sinful living, repeating the cycle of sin. Each time this cycle repeats, we see that the Israelites fall further down into more debased, sinful actions. And the phrase that we see in the book of Judges that summarizes that sinful cycle is that in those days there was no kin in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in Scripture we see the danger of doing right in our own eyes. Psalm 36 verse 2 says, For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. Proverbs 12 15, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 16 2, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Proverbs 21 2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do right in our own eyes is flawed and sinful. Left to our own nature and our own standards and our own judgments is sinful. We must do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. That's the only way that possible for us to do right. It has to be done according to God's will and God's standards. And today in this portion of scripture, we will see how we too, like Josiah, can do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Let us look at the first uh, two verses here in Second Kings chapter 22. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became kin, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adai of Boskoth, 
And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. The first thing I want you to see is that in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to pattern our lives after a godly example. In order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to pattern our lives after a godly example. It has been said that the biggest influence one can have in their life is mom and dad. Parents are both the best and worst influencers of their children. Parents are both the best and worst examples to their children. In the church, we often hear the critique that many of society's problems and sin can be attributed to the unstable family structure of fatherless homes. And I'm not disagreeing with that observation, but I do want to dig deeper into the fact that whether we had a mother and father in the home or not, we are still responsible for doing right in the eyes of the Lord. Whether we had a good and godly father or a bad and ungodly father in the home, we are still responsible for doing right in the eyes of the Lord. And we are held responsible by God because he has revealed himself to us and he has revealed his way to us in his word. Let us look a bit up in uh, 2 Kings chapter 21 verses 19 to 26, right before um, this portion of scripture. So if you just look back, verses 19 to 26 of the previous chapter, 21, it says, Amon was 22 years old when he became kin, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulamith, the daughter of Haraz of Jotba, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. So he walked in all the ways that his father had walked, and he served the idols that his father had served and worshipped them. He forsook the Lord God of his fathers and did not walk in the way of the Lord. The servants of Ammon conspired against him and killed the kin in his own house. But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against kin Ammon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah kin in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And he was buried in the tomb in the garden of Uzzah. Then Josiah, his son, reigned in his place. Josiah had a bad and ungodly father in Ken Ammon, who abandoned the Lord, did not walk in the way of the Lord, and did evil in the sight of the Lord by serving and worshiping idols. Ken Ammon was a bad and ungodly influence for his children to experience and be exposed to. If you look at the text, we see that Ammon walked in the way of his father Manasseh, who was a bad and ungodly influence on him. Amon chose to walk in the evil way of his father, Manasseh. And if you look in the portion of scripture we just read, 2 Kings 22, verse 2, we see that Josiah chose to walk in the way of David, his father. Pay close attention to that statement there. It says, Josiah walked in all the way of his father, David. Josiah's natural biological father was Amon who was a bad and ungodly influence on his life. But Josiah's real father figure, the person he chose to emulate, the person he chose to follow, the person he chose to pattern his life after, was Kin David, a man after God's own heart. And he walked in the way of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ, as it says in the ESV version. Or if you look at the NIV version, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. During Josiah's reign and time on earth, the best example that he could think of to emulate and follow as he followed God was the example of King David. Today we have a far better and greater example in Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And the fact is that we will never live up to his perfect ex example, but we can follow more mature Christians who are walking in the spirit of God, doing right in the eyes of the Lord. Josiah's biological father, Amon, was a bad example, but Josiah didn't allow his father's bad parenting and ungodly walk to affect his walk with the Lord. He found a godly person who he could pattern his life after. He saw a pattern of faithfulness that he could imitate and follow in King David. 
his ancestor, or his chosen father. And we could do the same whether we have or had a good or bad example in the household. I also want you to notice in uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, so let's look over a chapter. We're just going to look at two verses, verses 31 and 32. 2 Kings 23, move one chapter over, verses 31 and 32. It says, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatol, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Here we see that King Josiah's son, King Jehoahaz, was 23 when he began to rule, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Notice that even though Josiah had a bad and ungodly father, he chose to walk in the way of his chosen father, David. Also notice that even though Jehoahaz had a good and godly father in Josiah, he chose to be ungodly and walk in the way of his chosen fathers, those who did evil in the sight of the Lord. Who, in John chapter 8, verses 39 and 47, we see that whoever is of God hears the word of God and does the word of God. Whoever is of God hears the word of God and does what the word of God says to do. And in Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 to 9, we see that the true sons of Abraham are those who by faith hear the word of God and receive the word of God by obeying the word of God. The true sons of Abraham walk by faith just like Abraham. The true sons of Abraham pattern their lives by his godly example of faith in God. So like Josiah, in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to pattern our lives after a godly example. Let us look back in 2 Kings chapter 22. I'm going to look at verses 3 to 7. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to go to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkah, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work, who are overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord, doing the work, to repair the damages of the house, to carpenters, and builders, and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accountant made with them of the money delivered into their hand, because they deal faithfully. The second thing I want you to see is that in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to pursue God's work. In order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to pursue God's work. We see that Josiah had a desire to see the house of the Lord repaired when he ordered Shaphan, the secretary of the house of the Lord, to go up to Hilkah, the high priest, to give money collected in the house of the Lord to the workmen who were repairing the temple. His true desire was demonstrated by his actions of ordering the tangible assets of money to be distributed to the workmen. He didn't just say he wanted to see the temple repaired. He backed it up by providing the means by which the work could get done. He made the Lord's work a part of his budget. Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How much you're willing to invest in someone or something shows how much you truly care for them. How much time, money, and energy you're willing to invest in the kingdom of God shows how much you care for the kingdom of God. Are we pursuing the Lord's work or are we pursuing pleasure, passion, possessions, pride, and power? Many pursue pleasure. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 6, it says, For the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Living for pleasure is living a selfish and self-indulgent life. In fact, if you break the word pleasure down, it's about pleasing yourself instead of pleasing God. And as we said when we opened up, our aim or our goal in life should be to be found well-pleasing by God. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, we see that King Solomon lets us know that he pursued pleasure and it was all vanity. He experienced more earthly pleasure than anyone before him and anyone after him, for he was the wealthiest man to live, and he held nothing back in his self-indulgence and pursuit of pleasure. Solomon says it was vanity or useless like a vapor. Solomon spent and invested a lot of money, time, and energy in pursuing pleasure, and the result of his actions was unprofitable. There is no satisfaction that comes from pursuing pleasure, only a burning desire for more indulgence, which drains one of their time, energy, and money. The prodigal son is an example of one who spent all in, by, on sinful living in a faraway country. The prodigal son pursued pleasure and self-indulgence, which led to him draining all of his time, energy, and money. His pursuit of pleasure was unprofitable. In Hebrews 11, verse 24 and 25, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Pleasures, passions, possessions, pride, and power are all fleeting, temporary. The Lord's work is eternal. It will not fade away. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, we see it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, like Josiah, we need to pursue God's work. Let us look at verses 8 to 10 here in 2 Kings 22. Then Hilkah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the kin, bringing the kin word, saying, your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the kin, saying, Hilkah the high priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the kin. The third thing I want you to see is that for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to prioritize God's word in our lives. In order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to prioritize God's word in our lives. We are fortunate in this day and time to have easy access to God's word. Not so in Josiah's time. They had just found the book of the law. Unfortunately, many Christians are taking God's word and the accessibility to God's word that we have for granted. Many prolong getting serious about God's word and regularly studying God's word by pushing aside God's word and procrastinating for a later date instead of being entrenched by God's word on a daily basis. We have so many Bible translations, so many different study Bibles, so many different commentaries, so many different Christian books and resources at our disposal, and we have websites like Blue Letter Bible that have commentaries and interlinear word study tools that are accessible for free to anyone with internet access. We have so much information at our fingertips. And the danger is that with so much information and resources that we have access to, we can spend too much time looking at non-pertinent information. You know, I know a brother who once shared with me that there was a time in their life when they were reading so many books about the Bible, so many different Christian books and resources about God's word, about different topics on God's word. And then one day the Lord convicted him with the realization that he was spending more time reading books about God's word and about the Bible than he was actually reading God's word. And the lesson in that is that while it's good to read commentaries and books about topics in the Bible, nothing is 
better than actually reading the Bible itself directly from the source. And we need to make it a priority to read God's word, study God's word, memorize God's word, and obey God's word. Like David said in Psalm 119, 11, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Psalm 119, 176, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. You know, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm and the longest section of scripture. 176 verses, and it's all about God's word and the importance of God's word and the benefits of keeping God's word by obeying God's word. So like Josiah, for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to prioritize God's word in our life. Let us look at verses 11 to 13. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkah, the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the kin, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. The fourth thing I want you to see that in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to probe for the right interpretation and application of God's word. In order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to probe for the right interpretation and application of God's word. We should inquire or ask God about his word and its application for our lives. We can do this through prayer. We can also do this by seeking out the counsel of pastors, teachers, and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ about portions of scripture in which we may not fully understand Understand. Upon hearing God's word, Josiah understood the interpretation that his people, his ancestors, and even himself had sinned. It says in verse 13, For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Josiah understood that he was in a sinful environment. Even though he patterned his life after the godly example of David, his people did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord's anger was kindled against them and against their land. Josiah sought out the application of God's word. What is it that I must do? What is it that we must do? He sought out the application of God's word by sending the priest, the scribe, the servant, and two witnesses to inquire of God about the word that he had read. So they went to the prophetess, Hulda, and inquired about the word of God. And she told them the meaning of the word of the law, which was read. She spoke God's word to them and explained to them God's word. So like Josiah, we need to probe for the right interpretation and application of God's word in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord. Let us look at verses 14 to 20. Verses 14 to 20. So Hilkah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Har Harhaz, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the men who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and all its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the kin of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place, and shall not be quenched. But as for the kin of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him." 
Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the kin. The fifth thing I want you to see, in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to have penitent hearts. In order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to have penitent hearts. A penitent heart is a tender heart or a soft heart of contrition or godly sorrow that leads to repentance which is to have a change of mind which will effectively change your behavior. Because of his contrition and repentance, Josiah was at peace with God despite the fact that the nation had not repented. Josiah was promised by God not to suffer in the disaster of God's wrath that he would bring upon Judah for the sins of the people in which they pursued and had not turned away from. We need to have penitent hearts that respond to God's word with action of being disappointed about our sin and changing our behavior to reflect the Lord's will. You know, repentance is the new mindset that says, I don't want to do this anymore. It is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, like Josiah, we need to have penitent hearts. And then the sixth and final thing I want you to see is actually in chapter 23. Now, today we're not going to read chapter 23. I'm actually going to give that to you as a homework assignment. So when you go home today, I want you to be like the Bereans and make sure that everything I said was true. You can't just take my word for it. You got to probe for the right interpretation and application of God's word for yourself. You have to look in the word, make sure that everything I said was accurate, right? And so a part of your homework assignment is to read chapter 23 for this sixth and final part because it's a long chapter there. So you could break it it up for, you know, a little bit each day for the week, all right? And I'm going to check back with you next week when I see you to make sure that you did your homework assignment, all right? So, the sixth and final thing I want you to see is in chapter, 26, um, chapter 23, and that is in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to purge sin from our lives and from the land as much as we have the authority to do so in our surroundings. But all of us have the authority in our own lives to be able to purge sin from our own lives. And then whatever sphere of influence the Lord has given us at our jobs, in our homes, or in the social political environment, each one of us have different levels of authority and different spheres of influence that the Lord has given to us. We need to be able to purge the sin in our lives personally and to the influence that we have in our surrounding communities. All right? All right, so amen. So in order for us to do right in the eyes of the Lord, we need to what? Pattern our lives after a godly example. We need to pursue the Lord's work. We need to prioritize God's word in our life. We need to probe for the right interpretation and application of God's word. We need to have penitent hearts upon hearing God's word, right? That's repentance, a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. And then we need to purge sin from our lives and from our land according to the influence that God has given us within the land. If God can use an eight-year-old boy... God can use me too. If God can use an eight-year-old boy by faith, if he could do right in the eyes of the Lord, so can I too. And if I can do it, so can you. So let us be encouraged by King Josiah's example. And I'll just close out with one scripture reading. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us just uh, close in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Father God. Help us, Father God, like David, to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. And Father God, for us who have sinned, Father God, it says in your word, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it also says if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, Father God, upon reading your word to confess our sin, which means to agree with you that our sin is despicable, disgusting, and deserving of death. And then also, Father God, help us to repent, to turn away from our sin by having a change of mind that leads to a change of our behavior. Help us to purge the sin from our lives and in our our surrounding areas, the areas in which we have authority and influence over in which you have given us, Father God, and help us to seek to do right in your eyes, Father God, not our own eyes, not in our own sinful eyes, but in your eyes, Father God, by relying on your word and obeying your word. Father God, we ask these things in your son Jesus Christ's holy and precious name. Amen.